Actual test one. One to five. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Professor Watson, I'm glad I caught you. One of the other students mentioned you were leaving early today to attend a conference. Hi, Richard. Actually, I had to cancel my plans. It's a shame too, because I was really looking forward to it. I've just got too many papers to mark this week. But um, how are things going? Last time we talked, you uh, you mentioned being uncertain about what to do for your sophomore year. Actually, I've decided to do a semester abroad. Um, as you know, I'm a Spanish major. It'd be good to spend time in a country where I can, you know, use the language every day. That's a good idea. But um, I'm having trouble deciding where to go. I was hoping you'd have some advice for me. I see. Do you have a few places in mind? Yep, Spain is the most obvious choice. Aside from the chance to improve my Spanish, Spain is appealing because it's got a lot of history and um, culture. That's true. You'd probably learn a lot in Spain, but you should think about practical matters like cost. Spain can be expensive, so you should um have a budget in mind before making your decision. Oh, good point. I hadn't even started thinking of money. Is Spain really that pricey, though? Yes, especially if you want to live in a major city like Barcelona. The smaller towns are, of course, cheaper. However, I wouldn't recommend living in these areas. They don't have the same cultural opportunities. They don't have many museums or performance venues, so many students get bored living in places like that. I want to live somewhere I can try lots of different restaurants and festivals. Spain doesn't sound like a good option if it's too expensive to, well, to live in a big city. Um, let's see. Another place I was thinking of was Argentina. I've heard great things about Argentina. It's a popular destination for Spanish language majors at this university. At least a dozen go there every semester. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm hesitant about it. If I go somewhere with a lot of students from back home, it would be tempting to just spend time with them. And not meet local people. Right. Then you wouldn't be truly immersed in the culture. That would be such a waste. Well, have you considered another country in South America? I've looked into Peru a bit. It's got several historical sites I'd love to visit, especially Machu Picchu. I've always been interested in ancient cities. Travel websites say it's a must-see place. However, there are only a few study abroad programs that involve universities in Peru. So it's hard to find information about studying there. I think Peru's an excellent destination. I happen to know a student who went there for a semester and loved it. I'd be happy to put you in touch with her. Sure, I have a lot of things I'd like to ask her. No problem. I'll email you her um information. Also, I can write a letter of recommendation for you. Ah,、uh, you usually need to include one or two in your application. That's great. Thanks. Okay. I guess Peru is my new top choice. Now I just have to decide whether to go in the fall semester or the spring. I say go during the spring. That way you'll finish studying in June, and well, then you can take the summer to visit other countries in South America before the fall semester starts. Good tip. I'm already excited for next year. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. One. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Two, why does the professor mention museums and performance venues? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question.
If I go somewhere with a lot of students from back home, it would be tempting to just spend time with them and not meet local people. Right. Then you wouldn't be truly immersed in the culture. That would be such a waste. Three. What does the student imply when he says this? That would be such a waste. Four. Why does the student want to visit Peru? Five. What does the professor offer to do for the student? Six to eleven. Listen to part of a talk on art history. All right, everyone. Today we're going to focus on Victorian art. And let me just say, to understand Victorian art, you've got to understand what occurred during this period of history. Before we get going, though, I should probably ask: Does anyone know why it is called the Victorian era? Well. It was during the reign of Queen Victoria back in the 19th century, right? That's right. She ruled from 1837 to 1901. Okay, Victorian art was a response to the technological developments and social upheavals that occurred during this period. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing. The Reform Act was passed, which granted more people the right to vote, and a burgeoning middle class was developing. In the realm of art, major innovations were being made in the fields of fine art and design, in particular with fabrics, wallpaper, and ceramics. At the same time, with the invention of the steel plate printing process, printing became an increasingly important element of design. Artwork suddenly became affordable to the common people, thanks to this new technology. Which allowed printers to make thousands of copies at a time. Steel plate printing also brought about an enormous growth in the production of newspapers, magazines, and books. So public access to art increased as well. People were fascinated with these images. Subscriptions to publications increased, and pretty soon people wanted to buy prints of these artworks. So you had a growing audience of art collectors. This was particularly evident at the World Expo in 1851. It was held in London, and over six million visitors came to the city for the event over the course of five and a half months. Commentators at the time remarked with some astonishment at how much more knowledgeable about art the visitors were compared to past audiences. Let's think about this for a moment. In the past, who was it that patronized the arts? Wouldn't it have been mostly the aristocrats? You know, those born into wealth. That's true. But in Victorian times, there was a new class of wealthy individuals. These were the business people that made their money during the Industrial Revolution, and they became interested in art, but not the art of the aristocracy. These guys wanted the work of living artists, and not the work of masters from long ago. 
An example of this new breed of collectors was John Sheepshanks. He was a manufacturing baron during the mid 1800s who donated a very large collection of contemporary British art to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London just before his death. It was individuals like Sheepshanks who became the main collectors of Victorian art. Okay, so we've seen how the typical art collector changed, but what about the art itself? How did that change? Well, Victorian art was different in two major ways. First of all, it tended to be smaller because the patrons, well, they tended to live in villas, as opposed to the gigantic castles in which the aristocracy lived. This led to the development of the cabinet sized painting. A second difference was in the subject matter. As art audiences expanded to include those people outside the nobility, there was a renewed focus on pieces that were inspired by the things found in day to day life. This helped make the art of the era more comprehensible and easy to appreciate. Because patrons didn't need any sort of specialized knowledge in order to enjoy it. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 6. What does the professor mainly discuss? Seven. What was a benefit of the steel plate printing process? Eight. Why does the professor mention the 1851 World Expo? Nine. Why does the professor discuss business people? Ten. What does the professor say about John Sheepshanks? Eleven, according to the professor, what was the influence the new class of wealthy individuals had on the art world?
23 to 28. Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. The professor is discussing star catalogs. As I mentioned earlier, astrometry is the、uh, branch of astronomy concerned with calculating the positions and movements of objects in space. The field is highly dependent on star catalogs, and this is what I want to go over in detail today. A star catalog is essentially a list of stars that have been identified by astronomers. Normally, it will include a star's name or number and the coordinates for its location in the sky. Um, coordinates are sets of numbers that are used to indicate points on a map. Now, to get precise coordinates, astronomers have to measure two angles. The first angle is expressed in degrees, and the second one is expressed in hours. Essentially, it's like drawing an imaginary cross in the sky and finding where the two lines of the cross intersect. The more detailed star catalogs may also include other data, such as a star's brightness. Some indicate whether they're part of a larger cluster or group of stars. Um, I actually saw a star catalog recently at a, the Museum of Science. It was interesting. One has to wonder how did the idea for these things even come about. Let's see. Um, if you go back into ancient history, everyone from the Chinese to the Arabs produced star catalogs at one time or another. Each civilization had different motivations for producing star catalogs. Some tracked the stars for religious reasons.、Um, the Babylonians, for example, assigned names to stars because they thought these were spirits living in the sky. Others had more practical concerns. The ancient Greeks, for instance, were the first to seriously study astronomy as a science. They were searching for a way to explain the world around them. Why the sun, the moon, and the stars seem to move across the sky, or why some stars appeared in the sky at different times of the year. Sorry, but、uh, what did they use to observe stars? I mean, the telescope wasn't invented until the 17th century, right? Exactly. Um, 1608 to be precise. Before this, astronomers didn't really use any special device to study the stars, just the naked eye. Anyway, it was the Greek astronomer Hipparchus who put together the first comprehensive star catalog in the、um, it was the second century B.C. This catalog listed 850 stars in total, more than any previous catalog. Actually, Hipparchus was inspired by an earlier Greek star catalog. There's a story that says he was looking up at the sky one evening and he noticed one star that seemed out of place. It didn't match what the earlier catalog had predicted. Because of this apparent error, Hipparchus made it his goal to produce a new and more accurate star catalog. But what is a star catalog used for? Well, at its most fundamental, a star catalog is simply used to create a map of outer space. Such maps or charts give us a clearer picture of the universe we inhabit. But they do have some other uses. For instance, in ancient times, star catalogs were used to track the seasons, um, like a calendar. By observing how the positions of certain groups of stars changed over time, one could tell what time of the year it was. Additionally, star catalogs may be used to judge the distances to stars from Earth. This is invaluable to researchers investigating the age of our universe. And lastly. They provide a means for navigation, whether at sea, on land, or in the air. You can figure out your location on the planet by finding your position in relation to certain stars. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Twenty-three. What is the main purpose of the lecture?
24. How do astronomers determine a star's coordinates? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Um, I actually saw a star catalog recently at a, the Museum of Science. It was interesting. One has to wonder how did the idea for these things even come about? 25. What does the student mean when she says this? One has to wonder. Twenty six. Why does the professor mention the Babylonians? Twenty seven. What may have prompted Hipparchus to produce a star catalog? Twenty eight. According to the professor, what are some practical uses of star catalogs?